Stand in worship with us. story when I think it's in Matthew Matthew 21 when Jesus is coming into town and he's on the donkey so humbly and the crowd are there and they're putting the palm leaves on the ground and they're shouting and they're singing Hosanna Hosanna in the highest and it's more than just a praise and it's more than just we love you and it's more than adoration Hosanna means God save us and we need that if you're following Jesus and you are saved, praise God. Now we just need to work out our salvation, become more like Him every day. So when we see you, we find strength to face the day. In your presence, all our fears are washed away. When we see you, we find strength to face the day. Yeah. They're washed away. Hosanna, Hosanna. You are the God who saves us, worthy of all our praises. Hosanna, Hosanna. Come have your way among us. We welcome you here, Lord Jesus. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna. All right, praise God. Well, OCC, good morning. It's good to see you guys. I recognize faces. I don't know the names, but I recognize a lot of people. I see Wesley's back here. Awesome, man. Glad to see you back. You know, sometimes it's, uh, it's difficult. You come into worship, and you've come in from the cold, 
and probably in a rush because everybody's in a hurry Sunday morning, so you don't want to be late for church. And you rush in, and the first song is on, and it's hard to get into it. It's hard to find the spirit and the, the joy, and you're just kind of like waiting. And then the second song will come on. If you're waiting for us to do your favorite song today, we're not going to be playing it probably. <laughs> so just whatever the song is, just let it fill you. Just fall into it. We've been here since 8.30 this morning doing worship. So we are on fire now. We are fired up now. We just want to take it and move it all over onto you guys, all right? Let's do it. sin and darkness whose love is mighty and so much stronger the king of glory the king above all kings who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder and leaves us breathless in awe and wonder the king of glory the king above all kings this is amazing grace this is unfailing love that you would take my place that you would bear my cross you lay down your life and i would be set free oh jesus i sing for all that you've done for me chaos back into order who makes the orphan a son and daughter the king of glory the king of glory <laughs> who rules the nations with truth and justice who cleanses the land in all its brilliance the king of glory the king above all kings this is amazing grace this is unfailing love that you would take my place that you would bear my cross you lay down your life that i would be set free oh jesus i sing for all that you've done for me Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy, worthy, worthy. Amazing grace. This is unfailing love that you would take my place, that you would bear my cross. You lay down your life, that I would be set free. Whoa, Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. The Bible says to sing, you can sit down right now. The Bible says to sing a new song. And so I've written a new song. And this song is about God's amazement, how creative he is, how awesome he is. And I know there's been like a hundred songs written like this. Chris Tomlin has probably written a hundred songs like this. But I've never written a song like this. So this is my song. And this is me singing vertically to God 
not about God, but to God. And I'm just amazed by the world and how we can travel to places and see amazing things, things that we've created like the Eiffel Tower or amazing things that God has created like Niagara Falls. But we don't have to travel. Sorry, Judy. But we don't have to travel. We can stay at home and we can just enjoy family time together. And all those things are great. But if we don't have God to the center of our lives, then we've got a great life, but we don't have that abundant life that Jesus has promised us. And when people come up to me and say, why do you believe in God? How do you know that he's real? And I've got like a hundred stories I could tell them. But one I like to tell them is about gravity. Like if I take this microphone and I drop it, it's okay, Mark, I'm not going to drop it. But if I was to drop it, it would go down. Every time I drop it, it's going to go down. It's not going to go sideways and hit John in the head. It's not going to go up. It's not going to go over here and turn into a bunny rabbit. It's always going to fall down. And we know why, because that's the law of gravity. And that's one of the crazy things and amazing things that God has created for us just to show us that he's the king of kings. So this is called, I Can Hardly Believe My Eyes. We could travel to France and drive the English tunnel. We could fly to Peru and cruise the Amazon jungle, see amazing things. Or we could stay at home and play a crossword puzzle, have pizza delivered and a late night cuddle. We could live like kings. But living without you will never get me through. I can hardly believe my eyes You take my breath away The element of your surprise It happens every day You knock my socks off You make my jaw drop Oh, I can never repay Well, I'm starting to realize And I can hardly believe my eyes the law of gravity, it seems to make no sense. But the idle chatter can be quite intense without your spirit to guide me through. I've got 80 years in this amazing life, always trusting you to show me what is right. You're making me brand new. But living without you will never get me through. Day after day, you're giving yourself away. I can hardly believe my eyes. You take my breath away. The element of your surprise, it happens every day. You knock my socks off, you make my jaw drop. Oh, I can never repay. Well, I'm starting to realize And I can hardly believe my eyes There's a valley of doubt A valley quite deep Maybe you've heard me shout In a moment of disbelief I can hardly believe my eyes you take my breath away. The element of your surprise, it happens every day. Oh, I can hardly believe my eyes. You take my breath away. It's not a matter of compromise when I go your way. You knock my socks off, you make my jaw drop. I'll be your best man, you'd be my superman. Well, I'm starting to realize, and I can hardly believe my eyes. Well, I'm starting to realize, and I can hardly believe my eyes. Hmm. Praise God for the song.
step down into darkness open my eyes let me see beauty that made this heart adore you hope of a life spent with you here i am to worship here i am You're my God, you're all together lovely, all together worthy, all together wonderful to me. Well, I'll never know how much it costs to see my sin upon that cross. Well, I'll never know how much it cost to see my sin upon that cross never know how much it cost to see my sin couple of an announcements, some things to, uh, to highlight uh, so you're, you're aware of. In a couple of weeks' time, we're having a, uh, a soup luncheon together. And so uh, let me encourage you to, uh, there's a sign-up list at the, the welcome table where you came in. Uh, Deb Grimes was at the, at the table there, so uh, make, make sure you sign up and uh, be, be part of that. It'll be a great, great opportunity. Just have an opportunity to, to connect and give us more and more time to share together than we can do on a, on a, a, normally on a Sunday morning. We're also restarting one. Uh, anybody remember way back before COVID when we did one? Well, we're, we're going to restart one. And uh, one of the, the big needs right now in our community is, is food for the, the Sharing Place Food Bank. And so uh, you can see the, the, the list there. And so there's a table out in the Welcome Center, Welcome Area, the lobby. And so over the month of February, I encourage you to, to bring some groceries in. And then we can uh, assist with, um, with, the, with, with Sharing Place in that way. 
Other thing that's another thing we can get involved in and assist in terms of our community is, is coldest night of the year, which is which is coming up and towards the end end, end of Feb February, and so uh, you can go to the link there and. Uh, um, and, and, and sign sign up or sign up to, to, to walk and then raise support or or, 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 to, or to give to give support and then uh, one, one other thing just to, to highlight is uh, our remember our, our online prayer group on Sunday Sunday evening so 6:30 to 7:30 we meet to on, online to, to to pray together for a whole world of, 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 of needs and and as Scott already mentioned where's Scott this, well, he's, he's back there. As, as, as Scott mentioned this morning, it's so good to, uh, to see Wesley out, out, out this morning, and we need to continue to pray for his recovery. Um, some of you will know Matt Nobbs, who, who usually sits over there. Well, he fell this last week and, and broke his leg, uh, and so uh, pray, pray, pray for Matt as he recovers from that. Um, pray, continue to pray for, for, for Ray uh, after his heart attack. He's, he's re -re recovering, but he can't drive for the uh, next at least three three weeks and so can't get to school and so just continue to pray pray for pray for them pray as well for uh, for for Sean as he's down at uh, Inniswood Baptist Church for the next couple, n n number of months uh, help helping them through a transition period and uh, Brent, Brent is pre preaching this morning elsewhere as, as as well and we want to continue to pray for for Wayne Murdoch's brother and uh, Aaron Goldberg has asked us specifically to pray for him and and for Aaron to those of you who knew, who know and know Aaron uh, to him for specifically say I need prayer uh, he, he's, he's got a hernia, and so he's not sure when the surgery is going to be. And so, but he says, I'm, I'm in a lot, a lot, a lot of pain. Um, he was a little bit fearful because last time he had, um, he had to be put out for a procedure. Uh, he had all sorts of reactions to the anesthetic, but he's met with the anesthesiologist, and so they're, they're changing what they're doing. So he's re relieved with that. So let's come before the Lord and pray right now. So Father... We invite you, uh, by your Holy Spirit, to work in our hearts and our lives. We invite you to, to change things. We invite you to convict us. You, we invite you to challenge us, to encourage us. Thank you, Jesus, for the story that we're reading of what you have done and what you have taught as we're reading through the New Testament this year. Help it to, to come alive in our thinking. And so, Lord, I pray that you'd give us here at OCC, you'd give us as the church here in this city, uh, across this province and this country and around the globe, give us, give us hope, Lord. Remind us of our hope. Remind us of the foundation that we stand on. Remind us of the kingdom that we've inherited that can never be shaken. Remind us of this kingdom, Lord, because there is so much shaking that's going on in our world. So much shaking in our hearts and our, in our lives. We need you, Lord, to still, to comfort your people. And so, Lord, we, we, we've named a, a number of people, and there's many others, uh, I'm, I'm sure, in our, in our connections and our circles. And so, Lord, we, we bring them before you. And I invite you just to take these next couple of moments of quiet and just talk to the Lord. Tell the Lord what's on your heart. Tell the Lord what you've come with this morning. Bring before him that joy, that burden. Bring before him that struggle. Bring before him that pain. Come before him and declare again, Lord, here I am to worship. And as we do that, have your hands open, your heart open to receive from the Lord what he wants to do this morning in you. Allow him to minister into deep, deep places for the glory of his name. And so Lord, we pray. We pray together the words you taught your disciples. Our Father in heaven, may your holy name be honored. May your kingdom come. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today the food we need. 
Forgive us the wrongs we have done as we forgive the wrongs that others have done to us. Do not bring us to hard testing, but keep us safe from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let's watch a a short video. We have been intentionally exploring uh, what it means to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. I say intentionally because as I said when we began this series, every uh, passage of scripture, every text ends up being in one way or another about Jesus and about what it means to respond to his life transforming call to follow me. And so as we've been realizing over the last few weeks, for whether it's for the first time or for the 20th time, there are many dimensions to uh, discipleship. There are many ways of understanding our relationship with Jesus, many angles on the meaning of this call that he issues to us. Uh, and there are many different biblical texts that open up for us the, the privilege that, that Jesus is giving us. So someone asked me recently, given that there's so many different texts, can you suggest one essential text that gets at the very heart of discipleship? Let me me give you two, rather than one. Two intertwined, uh, inseparable, essential texts for discipleship. First one... (laughs) first one comes from Jesus himself. The second one comes from the Apostle Paul, who I think learned it from, uh, from uh, understanding Jesus. First, first one is in John's Gospel, John chapter 15. And, and, and Jesus said, I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. Remain in me, and I also, as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I'm the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. The bottom line is stay connected to Jesus, stay plugged into Jesus, live in Jesus. He lives in us as his disciples, we're to live in him. And the other text, and the one we want to spend some time exploring today, is found in Paul's letter to the church at Gal- churches at Galatia. Uh, this is a, probably a circular letter that went to a number of churches in the, in the region or province of Galatia. And we we'll want to focus on one verse, but we'll look at m- many in this passage. So for Galatians 5.16, Paul says, So I say, Walk by the Spirit, and you'll not gratify or carry out the desires of the flesh. 
I, I think that's the Apostle Paul's fundamental foundational discipleship text. For Paul, it all comes down to walk by the Spirit and you'll not carry out the desires of the flesh. One command and a wonderfully liberating promise. You know, some translations of the New Testament make it turn it into two commands. You know, one, walk by the Spirit. Two, do not carry out the desires of the flesh. I, I, th I think that's a misuse of the Greek language. It's not two commands. It's one command, then linked to it is a wonderfully liberating promise. Walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. <laughs> now, as you know, whenever we focus on just one verse, one line of Scripture, we need to do so in context. Turn with me to Paul's letter to the Galatians. Uh, and we're going to read in uh, chapter 3 and then into chapter 5. You foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Before your very eyes, Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed as crucified. I'd like to learn just one thing from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by believing what you heard? Are you so foolish? After beginning by, by means of the Spirit, are you now trying to finish by means of the flesh? Then down in, in verse 16 of chapter 5. So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify, you'll not carry out the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other. So what you are not to so the, so that you are not to do whatever they want. But if you're led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. The acts of the flesh are obvious. And then Paul lists some of them. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such thing there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let's keep in step with the Spirit. Let's not become conceited, provoking and envying, envying each other. Then chapter 6, verse 7, do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. Whoever sows to, to, to please their flesh, from the flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the Spirit, from the Spirit will reap eternal life. And so we come back to this essential verse. Walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. See, through the apostles' words, Jesus is calling us into a new life, into a new way to live it. Again, it's, not one, it's, it's one command. It's not not two. It's not walk by the Spirit and do not carry out the desire of the flesh, which is how many people actually read it. It's one command, walk by the Spirit, and a life-giving promise. You will then not carry out the desires of the flesh. Paul is using a, a grammatical construction, which in the Greek language is the strongest way of negating a future possibility. In, in the Greek, it's, it's a double negative and the aorist subjunctive. I don't know, it doesn't mean a lot to, to most of you, but basically it says, walk by the Spirit and you will not, you will not, you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. Before we unpack the rest of this passage, I, I want, to notice, want you to notice something about this one sentence that's not the case with a lot of other verses in the Bible. We can uh, rearrange the key terms in this one verse and end up with equally true statements. So, walk by the Spirit and you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. But we can flip it around. Walk by the flesh and you'll not carry out the desires of the Spirit. It's also correct to say walk by the flesh and you will carry out the desires of the flesh. And it's also correct to say, walk by the Spirit, and you will carry out the desires of the Spirit. Kind of, kind of neat, isn't it? So let's, let's seek to understand a little bit of Paul's key terms here for, for flesh and spirit. What, what does the Apostle Paul mean by them? What does this Apostle of Jesus, how is he using this uh, fundamental discipleship text? 
flesh. In, in, in the Greek, it, it's the word sarx. It, refers, it can refer to our bodily existence as in flesh and blood. Um, that's how Paul used it earlier in this letter in Galatians 2.20, a, a verse which many of you I know have quoted. I've been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me and the life I now live in, in the body, in the, in, in, in the flesh. I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Their flesh clearly refers to our concrete uh, earthly existence, to our, our materiality. But in Galatians 5.16 and, and, and in other places like Romans 8, Paul uses the term theologically. Flesh is Paul's shorthanded way of describing the human condition apart from grace. It's, it's human existence that comes about because of, uh, because of sin. Flesh is the existence, is the sphere of existence in which uh, ego desires to be number one. Flesh is the sphere of existence in which the ego disregards and even rebels against the living God. Flesh is Paul's shorthanded way of describing the human condition apart from God. Uh, Martin Luther put it this way, flesh is the self turned in on itself. And then the word spirit, in, in, in the Greek, it's, it's the word pneuma. Uh, we get it in the English language, pneumatic, has to do with air. And the spirit in the scripture often refers to the, the deepest recesses of our being. It, it's how Jesus uses a term when he said to his sleepy disciples in the Garden of Gethsemane, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. But in the context here of, Gal of Galatians, it's clear that spirit in Galatians 5.16 refers to the spirit of God, to the Holy Spirit, to the third person of the Trinity, to the very breath of God who comes to live with and in Jesus' disciples. Earlier in this letter, in Galatians uh, 4, um, ver verse 4 and following, Paul, Paul says, But when the time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law, that we might receive adoption to sonship. Because you are his sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, the spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. You're no longer a slave, but God's child. And since you are his child, God has also made you an heir. <coughs> Paul speaks of God's twofold sending. God sends his son into the world, and God sends his spirit into the hearts of all who follow his son in the world. Walk by the spirit. Walk by the Holy Spirit. Walk by the very life of God, and you will not, you will not, you will not carry out the desire of the self turned in on itself. So let's, let's, let's unpack this a little bit more. Flesh. Life, life in, the, in the flesh, uh, I think we can summarize it or characterize it by, by five basic prop uh, propositions. First, life in the flesh is life lived in the body, in the material world, in, in, in the stuffness of creation. Life in the flesh is centered in and around the self, the ego. Uh, the most frequently used words in the vocabulary of the self are I, me, mine, myself. So, so life in the flesh is therefore self-oriented. It's me first. It's self-directed. It's all about my vision. It's self-governed. I did it my way and no one's going to tell me how to live. It's self-empowered. Given enough time and better technology, we can fix this world. And then fourth, the goal of life in the flesh is to build one's own reputation and kingdom, establishing and maintaining one's own name and rule. And, the, and fifth, the basic desire of the flesh is control. Since I'm the center, since I'm the master of my own life, it's all up to me. I must control the world around me. You know, the basic drive of the flesh is to put people into nice, neat boxes so they can be controlled. And as the flesh does acknowledge God, it puts God in a box so it can keep God under control. Now, it's also important to recognize that the flesh can wear religious clothing. Indeed, a lot of religion is, is fundamentally flesh. Most religion is a human effort to placate God, to, to win God's favor for our own personal selfish reasons. The flesh can God talk. It's just that the God it talks about is God that's created in our image, a God who strangely conforms to and condones our agenda. Now, flesh can even come up with some nice religious cliches, like God helps those who help themselves, or look to the God who is within you. Yeah, yeah that's not in Scripture. You know, some countries, the flesh even prints in God we trust on its currency. 
But everyone knows that it means in, God, in our currency we trust, in our power and wisdom we trust, not in God. In fact, God's not even allowed to talk about in the places where that currency is minted. Then the word spirit, life in the spirit, in the spirit of God, can be characterized, like, again, by, by five uh, propositions that c- compare and contrast with, with life in the flesh. So life in the spirit is also lived in the body, in, in the material world. And, and this is crucial to, uh, to grasp. Life in the spirit, in the spirit of the transcendent God, is an earthly life. Earthy life. Not earthly, but earthy. It's all part of, of God's intention and creation in the incarnation. The very life of God who hovered over the deep void breathed the world into existence. The very life of God who indwelt and animated the body of Jesus of Nazareth comes to live in our bodies in this material stuff. You know, Paul, Paul says, do, do you not know, and he's, this is in his first letter to the Corinthians, that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you? The Spirit takes up residence in our bodies. He doesn't transport us out of, our, out of or beyond this, uh, the space-time material existence for which we're made. Walking in the Spirit, whatever else it means, is not opposed to eating and drinking and enjoying the creation. It's not opposed to laughing and playing and making love. Indeed, the presence and power of the Spirit enhances these aspects of earthly existence. Life in the spirit, like life in the flesh, is lived in the body, in our tangible, measurable, visible bodies. And that's why Paul exhorted us, as we, as we saw in, the, in his letter to the Romans, present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Life in the spirit is lived in these bodies. All spiritual disciplines involve the body. The New Testament knows nothing, no, absolutely nothing of disembodied spirituality. But second, in, in contrast to life in the flesh, life in the spirit is centered in and around the living God. There's been a, a shift in the center, a huge shift. It's like a Capernaum revolution. The ego has moved out of the center and the triune God has moved in. And so therefore, life in the spirit is, is God-oriented. Holy is your name. It's God-governed. Your kingdom come. It's God-directed. Your will be done. And God-empowered. We cannot, but you can. And then fourth, in in contrast to uh, life in the flesh, the goal of life in the spirit is God's reputation, God's kingdom, God's fame, God's reign. And so in contrast to to life in the flesh, life in the spirit is not driven to control because I'm I'm not in the center anymore. It's no longer all about me to make the world go around. I can let go of control and rest in the control of the living God who loves me. And so we can appreciate why in Galatians 5.17, Paul says that flesh and spirit are are in opposition to one another. For the flesh desires what's contrary to the spirit, and the spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict. They are in opposition with each other so that you are not to do whatever you want. You know, the flesh is so radically egocentric that it's actually hostile towards God. Read Romans 8.7. The flesh perceives the living God to be a threat. So determined to live for itself, it exerts its independence. The flesh cannot help but finally hate God. And what we're seeing in our age, in our our time, just below the surface and and sometimes not very far below the surface, is, is a bubbling up of a deep hostility to the things of God. For the reality of the living God exposes the illusion, the lie that we are captain of the ship, that we are in control. Paul says the flesh hates the spirit. And this is crucial for discipleship. The spirit stands against the flesh. That's putting it mildly. The spirit seeks to bring the flesh to an end. The spirit being the Holy Spirit invades the flesh to burn away all that's not holy. We could take, go to uh, Malachi 3 uh, for first three verses and you, you'll see some of that. See, the flesh and spirit are in opposition. The spirit will not settle for a compromise arrangement. And, and that's good news, but not necessarily immediately so, because on first reading it seems offensive and, and seems frightening. 
But when, when we come to recognize and rejoice in the fact that the flesh fights the spirit and the spirit fights, fights the flesh, we, we should expect that because these are radically different ways of living. Flesh and spirit result in radically different qualities of life. Each way of living in the flesh and in the spirit generate very different types of attitudes and values and drives and behaviors and character traits and lifestyles. The quality of life produced by the flesh. Paul calls it the acts or deeds of the flesh. It's, it's not, a, not a pretty list. Uh, we, we, we read it earlier. I, I want to br- briefly go through it. It's, it's, and it's offensive to our postmodern sensibilities. But Paul doesn't mince words here. He just puts it all out there. As offensive as it may be to, to many. This is what walking by the flesh will lead to. It's the natural outcome of self-centered, self, self-grounded, self-governed, self-empowered life. So Paul's list here, like, like many of the lists in, in, in Scripture, is not exhaustive or complete. He says the acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, hate, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. Now that a phrase and the like or things like these means that this is just part of the list. The New Testament scholar uh, Otto Bett uh, writes, this seemingly chaotic arrangement of these terms is reflective of the chaotic nature of evil. This chaos is contrasted with the oneness of the fruit of the Spirit with its orderly arrangement. So Paul, he says these acts, these deeds of the flesh are are evident. They're they're visible for all. They're evident in in our our sexuality, in our spirituality, in our relationships, in society. And so he says in our sexuality, flesh issues deal with with immorality, with with sexual intercourse outside of the one man, one one woman marriage covenant. It has to do with impurity, with unnatural sexual behaviors, with overt sensuality, with open and reckless abandonment of decency. In our spirituality, the flesh issues in in idolatry, in in creating other gods, in trusting someone or or something else other than the living God. Sorcery, that's that's a word that uh, one commentator says means the secret tampering with the powers of evil. It's actually the Greek word pharmakeia, from which we get our word pharmacy. And in Paul's world, it referred to drugs used to alter one's state of consciousness. In our personal relationships, the flesh issues in, in enmities or quarrels, with, with strife, with, with jealousy, with, with out, outbursts of, of anger, fits of rage, with, with disputes, selfish ambition, dissensions, uh, factions, party spirits, envying. In society, the, the flesh issues in things like, like drunkenness and carousing and, and all of the wreckage that uh, follows. And according to Paul, the natural consequence... This is all the natural consequence that emerges from from walking in the flesh with walking with self at the center. And according to Paul, and according to all the rest of the biblical authors, it's the only quality of life that the flesh produces. (coughs) That's why the only hope for human societies in every age is is a fresh revolution, a fresh moving of the Spirit of God. Reform movements that are driven by the flesh, as good as they can be, can never finally bring about real, lasting change or transformation. Galatians 6, 7 and 8, do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A person reaps what they sow. Whoever sows to please their flesh, from the flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the spirit, from the spirit will reap eternal life. Sow to the flesh, and we reap corruption. Sow to the spirit, and we reap life. And then Paul adds a a solemn warning. At the end of verse 21, he says, I warn you, as I did, did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. He, he's not saying you need to be perfect, completely fleshless in order to inherit the kingdom. He's saying, but he's not saying if any of the deeds of the flesh show up in us, we're out. He's saying if this list describes the overall long-term character of our lives, we're in trouble. We're being ruled by the kingdom of the flesh, raising the question of whether the kingdom of God has in fact broken into our lives. The quality of life produced by the spirit stands in marked and refreshing contrast to the flesh. And so Paul calls that the fruit of the spirit. 
the word fruit emphasizes that, that we don't produce it. It's, it's not our doing. And, and Paul is, is echoing what Jesus said in, in, in John 15. Fruit comes from living in Jesus. Paul uses, and, and, and make sure we get this, uses the singular fruit. These qualities cannot be separate. They, they come in a cluster. It's not the fruits of the Spirit. It's the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. It, it's a description of, 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 of Jesus. Um, the fruit of the Spirit is not uh, any kind of love. It's, it's Jesus' love. It's not any kind of joy. It's Jesus' joy. It's not just any kind of patience. It's Jesus' patience. It's not just any kind of gentleness. It's Jesus' gentleness. It's not just any kind of self-control. It's Jesus' self-control. The Spirit of Jesus indwells his disciples, fighting against the self turned in on itself, causing the very character traits of Jesus to well up, to grow up, to, to be displayed in us. So look at Paul's list a little more carefully. Paul says the Spirit desires to reproduce in us the virtues that mark Jesus' earthly life. Love, Jesus' sacrificial, unconditional caring for people. Joy, Jesus' delight in the love of his Father that no circumstance can rob. Peace, Jesus' inner tank tranquility born of his confidence in the goodness and power of his Father. The Spirit also desires to reproduce in us the attitude that Jesus had towards others, patience. Jesus' ability to endure difficult people and, and difficult circumstances. Kindness, Jesus' tender concern which leads to, to generosity. Goodness, uh, Jesus' integrity and his honesty and his longing for justice. Uh, and the, Jesus, the Spirit desires to reproduce in us the marks of Jesus' own inner, inner maturity, faithfulness. You know, Jesus' remarkable confidence in the Father's promises and the Father's reputation for keeping his word. Gentleness, Jesus' inner freedom from the need to hurt, or to retaliate. Self-control, Jesus' mastery of the tongue, his mastery of, of human de de drives and, and, and passions. A wonderfully delicious cluster of fruit. And Paul says, against such things, there is no law. Against the fruit of the Spirit, there is no law. What, what, what's, what's Paul getting at? Let, let me tell you a story. Um, the father of a, pro of a professor I know made his living as, a, as a, a nuclear physicist and spent much of his career caught up in the fear-driven frenzy of the Cold War. And in the early 1990s, as, as the relationship between, some, between U.S. And, 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 and Russia were, were thawing, the relationship between the West and the uh, People's Republic of China was starting to open, he had the privilege of, of traveling to China with a team of, of Western physicists. And they met in, in uh, Beijing at the University University of Peking with a, with a group of Chinese physicists. And during those visits, he met a, a Dr. Fung, and that, that's not his real, real name. Uh, on the first meeting of the teams, Dr. Fung spotted the life of Jesus in this professor I know, in his, in his father, and ventured to say that he too was a Jesus follower. And, and during their, their years of friendship, Fong wrote a, Dr. Fong wrote an essay on love, first looking at love from the perspective of a, of a scientist, a physicist, and then love as a disciple. And Dr. Fung writes that he finally understood love when he experienced Jesus' love for him as, a, as an individual, as a, as a sinner. And he especially liked Paul's letter to the Galatians, and, and it's particularly the line that we looked, I, I just read, against such things there is no law. And Dr. Fung took that to mean that no one could make a law that could keep him from living the fruit of the Spirit. Dr. Fung uh, spent a number of years in prison during the Cultural Revolution when all kinds of laws were made against all kinds of things. But no law could made, be made against love. No law could be made against him loving his fellow prisoners or loving the guards who hurt him. No law could be made against experiencing the joy of the Lord in his prison cell. No law could be made against knowing peace in the midst of terrible circumstances. No law could be made against patience or kindness or gentleness. No, no law could be made against exercising self-control when he wanted to take revenge on his enemy. For from deep within, 
the wellsprings of our being, the mighty, the free, the indwelling spirit overcomes the flesh and brings forth the character of Jesus in us. So one of the questions that this raises is what part do we play in this? If this cluster of character traits is the product of the spirit, do we even have a part, part to play? Yes, we do. Walk. It's an active verb. Walk by the Spirit. It's a call to some action. So how do we walk by the Spirit? How, so that we don't carry out desires of the flesh, but we carry out desire of the Spirit. Now, we're, we're going to tackle that question in, in much more detail next, next week. But let me say this for now. Walking by the Spirit involves much intentionality. It involves intentionally adopting a proper attitude, proper posture towards the flesh on one hand, and a proper posture towards the Spirit on, on the other. What's the proper attitude or proper posture towards the flesh? Crucifixion. That's what Paul said in in verse 24 of Galatians 5. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Proper posture towards the Spirit? Surrender. If you are led by the Spirit, Paul says in verse 18 of Galatians 5. We cannot be led without surrendering, surrendering the reins of our lives, yielding to the Spirit's yielding, welcoming his work of overcoming the flesh and reproducing the life of Jesus in us. As I said, we're we're gonna explore much more of this next week. But for for today, I think we're simply to be still and reflect on these lists. The lists, the acts of the flesh, the fruit of the Spirit. And I'm gonna invite you to to, to, to be still just for a, a couple of moments and quietly surrender, and quietly reflect on these to whatever degree we can today. Ask the Holy Spirit to identify and root out any of the acts of the flesh that we see in our souls, that we see in our lives, and ask the Holy Spirit then to go deeper in our souls and fulfill his desire to make us more and more like Jesus. So let's take a a couple of moments to be still. (coughs) Father God, you do your work in us. Holy Spirit, identify, root out any of the acts of the flesh that you identify in us. Bring us to a place of confession and repentance, of acknowledging and turning away. And then, Lord, we ask as well that your spirit would be intentionally cultivating and growing your fruit in our lives as we remain connected, rooted, grounded in your spirit. Amen. Invite the team to come back and and lead us in our closing song. isn't it?
our God and King. Your love endures forever. With His good, He is above all things. His love endures forever. Sing praise. Sing praise. With a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, His love endures forever. For the life that's been reborn, His love endures forever. Sing praise, sing praise, sing praise, sing praise. Here we go. Forever God is faithful, forever God is strong, forever God is with us, forever. God is faithful, forever God is strong, forever God is with us, forever. Praise Jesus.